Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, and uh, here's to the end of a very long week, I imagine, for all of us. Um, this series, Experts Live, is absolutely dedicated to education. It's meant to be interactive. We at Charlotte's Web know that sometimes there's a lot of confusion around um, CPD and hemp, and sometimes there's mythology, and so we are completely dedicated to being generous with education. So I'm here to also let you know um, that as of this week, we formally announced that we have a new partner in that education. And he is with us today. His name is Dr. Quan Stewart. He's often um, called the street vet. And he received that moniker because he has a really big heart. And apparently he likes to work really hard for social causes. So Dr. Quan kind of, uh, uh, pierced all of our hearts here in the Charlotte's Web family because we learned of his story of in San Diego where he has his practice um, since the last really awful recession he started doing a lot of pro bono work and going out and going to where homeless populations were in his area and bringing his medical bag and providing care as he could um, for the pets um, and so that has kind of snowballed and Dr. Kwan, you're kind of famous now. Um, if there is a celebrity vet, it would be you. And uh, you have a TV show of the same name, The Street Vet. But why we're partnering with Dr. Kwan is we think that across the country, not just in California, we want his mission to be um, supported. And that's a mission of taking this pro bono work and providing um, helpful health care that's allowed across the country. So that's why Charlotte's Web has made a really um, uh, appropriate donation to your nonprofit, and I'll let you talk about that. I'm going to shut up now, um, enjoy the show, and do ask questions um, so that we can have Dr. Kwan's expertise answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all for joining. Uh, that was a very warm introduction. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about myself, even though Sylvia said, yeah, really go into your background and what you do and why you became a vet. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think for context purposes, people are always curious why we became vets, um, why we love it, and, and for me, why I specifically started helping the homeless and their pets. So um, I'll run through that real quick, and then I'd love to, to take any questions that you guys might have. I, um, real quick, so I... My lightning rod moment for becoming a vet, which many veterinarians can recall, when was that um, moment you had when you knew it was seven years old for me, and I was um, at a movie with my mother of all places. And I walked out of the theater and I was holding her hand, I looked up and I said to her, and I barely remember this moment, she, she recounts it, and every time she, she tells a story, it gets more and more embellished, but I looked up at her and I said, when I grow up, I wanna be an animal doctor. Um, and, and that was really the moment from that moment forward, I started, uh, you know, reading books and taking an interest in animals and, and that led to vet school and beyond. Um, the movie, by the way, was a black stallion, still a classic today. And, um, one of my favorites it still makes me cry when I watch it. Uh, but yeah, vet school, uh, my alma mater is Colorado State. Um, I'm from New Mexico. So it was the closest veterinary school to me, and, and actually at the time one of the best, so I was lucky to get in. Uh, and graduated in 1997, so that ages me a little bit. I've been doing this a little while, now I'm starting to feel old. So 23 years in the business. Um, I've worked in all facets of the veterinary profession as an associate vet, as an emergency vet, um, for a large nonprofit at American Humane, um, running a group of practices and vaccine clinics. So I've I've had my hands in a lot of different areas, which is great because I've, um, I've really gained an expertise and understanding, I feel like, of what, what animals need and what pet owners need to support them to care for their pets. Uh, so to turn to this, the whole street vet thing quickly, I, um, there was a time that I was a shelter vet um, going back around 2008, 2009. It was during the time of the recession. And at the time, a lot of people were unfortunately relinquishing and, and just plain old dumping their pets at the shelter. They didn't have um, the economic resources to care for their pets. So there were a lot of drop-offs um, and not many pickups. And it was at that time that I um, um, realized that there was not just a need in my immediate area, but really in the community as a whole, 
But more than that, the people who, who just have trouble finding resources at all, we're talking about homeless people mainly, semi-homeless people. One, don't have the money, and two, don't have the wherewithal to find out where they can get help oftentimes. So I got the crazy idea one day, I was gonna go out and set up a table near a homeless food bank, and I did, and found a customer base. People were lined up to get lunch that day, and about uh, a fourth of them had a pet, which holds true for the stat that says about 25% of our homeless population own a pet. So I just called them over and I said, I'm, I'm a veterinarian, I'm Dr. Quan Stewart, I'm here to help and uh, do it at no cost if, um, if you'd let me. And what I thought was gonna be a one-off turned into a, you know, an eight-year journey. So I went from that to then walking, literally just packing up a bag and walking the streets looking for homeless people and alleyways under bridges um, who needed help. So that eventually led to a docu-series called The Street Vets and now my nonprofit called um, Project Street Vet. It is, it's really my passion and, and close to my heart to help the underserved. And, um, and it's, it completes me as a veterinarian. You know, one aspect, I have to go out and work and I have a day job uh, to earn money and support myself. But, you know, this, this for me is really why I got into it. And now recently, uh, joining forces with Charlotte's Web, and for good reason. I, um, I, I believe that um, industrial hemp for pets is a new frontier. We're just starting to learn more about it and the benefits and there's a lot in front of us and a lot we're still trying to learn and understand and educate pet owners like yourselves about. So um, I'm happy to be here and thank you Sylvia and I'll take any questions you guys want to throw at me and I'll do my best to answer them. You know um, Dr. Kwan it's a it's a time of year where we're heading towards summer celebration with the 4th of July. It's also with the pandemic, all kinds of people, are, you know, are experiencing ongoing stress, right? And particularly vets, I understand during this time of year, not veterinarians, but um, veterans who've helped fight for our country. Um, but those with PTSD have a particularly hard time around the week of 4th of July. But that's also true for pets. And I don't think a lot of people understand why this holiday is particularly stressful on our furry friends. Could you address that? Yeah. Um, so first we have to understand that pets um, don't really understand what the whole point of fireworks are. And if you start there, then it would make sense. Almost like a baby for the first time hearing a, a large thun thunderous boom, what the meaning of it is. So they can't rationalize what's happening. And that for a lot of them starts um, a noise phobia. So a lot of these pets develop noise phobias over time. And we see what's called a flooding reaction. So this is a behavioral term, a flooding reaction. And each time they hear it, it becomes worse and worse. And the stress and anxiety becomes worse and worse every time they hear it. So you'll notice for a lot of these pets, uh, the first year they seem scared or nervous. The following year, it's a little worse. The third year, they're trying to jump through a plate glass window and so on and so forth. So it is stressful for a lot of pets. And a lot of times we don't even recognize the cues uh, that they're trying to tell us this is, this is damaging. Sometimes they'll cower, they'll hide, um, they'll do weird behaviors like excessively lick their paws. But a lot of times these are all signals of them trying to tell you this is stressful, mom and dad. Um, so yeah, you know, as a vet now doing this 23 years, I see it every year. I have to prescribe a group of my patients um, tranquilizers or methods to, to control the phobia. Um, but for some, it is excruciating. You know, hearing these sounds is excruciating for them. So, and do dogs have ears that particularly make this more acute? Is there something physiological? Well, they're more sensitive to the sound, yes. Um, but again, it's the lack of understanding why it's happening over and over and over that, that increases the anxiety and the stressful chemical reaction that happens as a result. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I can tell horror stories of pests I've seen that have done just about everything to escape the noise, but you can't escape the noise. They think running outside, um, crashing through the door, running into the street where they've been hit um, to escape the noise, but it just obviously it doesn't happen. It's all around. They, again, they don't have the wherewithal to understand. So that's where, um, well, some training um, uh -huh. comes in, and then at times some products comes in to help uh, mitigate or manage the stress. And what kind of products would you recommend? Well, um, 
Yeah, so you know, there are there are a group of pharmaceuticals that we turn to in severe cases, but for the less severe cases, um, a couple tips here. One, you want to try and sequester your pet um, to a comfortable and familiar place. So um, if they've never been in the garage, don't put them in the garage because that's gonna make it worse. But if they like and familiar with their bedroom or your bedroom or their kennel, for example, that's a place to start. Second, you want to try and drown out the noise. So some sort of form of white noise, a radio, the television can help. And then third, you are their biggest comfort. As mom and dad and pet parents, you are their most com comfortable assets. So being next to them and petting them and talking to them um, can help. Great. Um, I'm not seeing anybody, anyone asking questions. Please feel free. Um, it might be some behaviors you've seen in your own pet. Um, it might be uh, more broad in general, like there's no bad questions. So please use the Q&A function, everybody. Um, what what are you seeing just in summertime, you know, in your veterinary practice? What are some of the more common, I guess, injuries? And does beha behavioral health come into play as much as physical health issues in your practice? Yeah, behavioral health is always a big piece. You know, I, we joke as veterinarians that we're, you know, two parts, you know, medical doctor and then one part psychiatrist or psychologist. Mm -hmm. So understanding the way a pet thinks, they react, um, all connects to how their body reacts and, and how the homeostasis or the health of the animal is maintained. Uh, so yeah, you know, here, summertime, as we know, is a time when pets get out. I can tell you as an emergency veterinarian, and I still love to do emergency practice. So once or twice a week, I'll do emergency shifts. I just love to keep my skills sharp, and I love the, the pace of it all. But during the summertime, we see an uptick in dog fights. Naturally, people are out at dog parks, and dogs are interacting. I see an uptick in hit by car accidents, mm. um, which is a big one. And then of course, with the, the holidays, we have the bookend of um, Memorial and Labor Day, and then of course, Fourth of July in the middle. So we have barbecues, we have fireworks. So I'll see food toxicities also. A lot of those roll in throughout the summer. Yeah. Bee stings is probably the fourth. So there is, yet yeah, the summertime is busy, busy time for an emergency vet. Um, and we have to keep our thinking hat on at all yeah. times, but uh, we do have an arsenal in front of us to help manage the problems. Dr. Kwan, we have a question with someone. It sounds like she has a new puppy at home. She's asking, how can she train that puppy to be more conditioned to sounds like fireworks? Yeah, that's a great question. So you can condition your pet over time. And, you know, typically we start slow and low. So remember that saying, slow and low. Um, if you're worried about the upcoming 4th of July that they may have a reaction to the sound, you can start by tapping or tinkering or making a small popping sound uh, that mimics the sound of a firework. And again, if you take it s slow and low, it may, it may gradually condition them to what they're going to hear that night. Now, if you see the reaction or, a, or it, it seems like or appears that your pet is getting stressed and turning and reacting, well, then you want to stop because that then flows into something we call flooding. Again, that behavioral reaction where you see an increase every time they hear the sound. But initially, yeah, you can start with a tapping or a dinging or a small cracking or popping or put something on the television, um, maybe a 4th of July fireworks show that's recorded or something on YouTube and have them just sit hmm. and start to hear the sound so they get a little familiar with it. Oh, thank you. And we have a um, question from Christopher. It sounds like um, Christopher's dog shakes absolutely uncontrollably when fireworks are going off. Um, hugging helps, but would anxiety vests be a good idea? Yeah, so the thunder jacket is something that's been around for a while. Um, it's, it's one of those tools that seems to work in some, but I would say in the majority, uh, I do not see um, a great improvement. Um, you know, again, we have a lot of different things at our disposal. Some things work and some things don't. And it really has to be tailored to the pet. If your pet is having a severe reaction to the sound, then they may need some pharmaceutical help. Yeah. But if it's mild, again, I would start with setting them aside, putting them in the bedroom, turning on the fan or the radio or the television, whatever they're used to hearing, and then just sitting next to them and petting them. Um, those are for mild cases. For more severe cases, we have to reach out to our bed and, and get additional help. Yeah. 
We're having several questions just about overall anxiety in pets, um, in particular dogs. So what can, what can you say to that? Overall anxiety? Um, wow, that is a, um, that's a big Pretty umbrella. Broad. Yeah, um, it, you know, it, it would help, you guys can, can narrow it down because anxiety takes many, many forms. Um, we're, we're talking about one with uh, the noise phobia, but uh, how about separation anxiety? I'm sure some pets experience that. That's one that I see often. So separation anxiety, mom and dad are home, pets there, mom and dad go to work, pet experiences some sort of anxiety because you just left. Um, fairly common. And it's a, it's a scale, it's a sliding scale of extreme down to mild. But I'll tell you this, for very mild cases or to um, start to condition your pet to you being away, this, is, this would be a great tip for the puppy we just talked about. Don't give them cues that you're leaving because they pick up on that very quickly. So for example, when dad says goodbye to Fido, he goes up, he gives him a hug, he rubs him, says, I'll see you soon. He gets the keys, he jingles the keys, and all of that is a signal to Fido that dad's leaving and now I'm getting stressed. So um, don't jingle the keys, don't give him the big goodbye, just quietly say it and walk out the door. And again, to relax him a little bit, what you can do on weekends, is to leave for five or 10 minutes and then come back and then leave for 30 or 40 minutes and then come back in the, ha the house. And that reassures them that dad's not leaving all day or dad's not leaving forever. Um, so that's, yeah. that's an easy tip for separation anxiety. There's also um, the fact that we humans share something physiologically with dogs um, other than really expressive faces. Um, we share endocannabinoid systems. And could you speak to the science of that? And as I understand it, don't dogs have more endocannabinoids in their brain than we do? Yeah, that is the case. Um, so the ECS, mm -hmm. as we call it for short, um, is prevalent in people and we're finding most mammals, including our dogs and cats. And this system um, sort of regulates balance and homeostasis in our bodies. And we're really, again, just on the forefront of really understanding how this works but it's, it's a system that's been a part of this for a long time. And in the ECS, there are basically receptors um, that act as, you may think of it as a lock. And the, the product, the medication, um, the hormone, for example, is the key. And it can come along and unlock this receptor and start a reaction within our body and our cells. And in this case, for the ECS, it does help regulate uh, what, what we like to think of as homeostasis or balance within the body. So a shortage of, of um, phytocannabinoids uh, or endocannabinoids can lead to uh, dysregulation of the body, sets you out of homeostasis. And that can affect a number of things like immune system function, um, sleep function, gastrointestinal function. So all these things are linked to this ECS. And we're finding that dogs actually have more receptors than people, namely, in their brain and central nervous system. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think you helped to make sense of that because um, it can be so confusing. Um, we have a very specific question. So, and I think a lot of people probably have witnessed this in their own dogs. Um, my 12 year old dog's general stress level seems to be increasing as his eyesight and hearing are diminishing. Any bump or other noise that sounds like a door knock, even setting a coffee mug down, starts the barking to defend the house. I hate to reprimand him as he's just doing his job, but I would like to cut down on his edginess. Yeah, um, and you, Sylvie, did you say, how old was the dog? He's 12 years old. 12 years old. Did, did it list a breed by chance? Um, no, but this is from Tom, and if Tom wants to let us know the breed, that would be yeah. helpful. Well, yeah, 12 years old, you're definitely considered geriatric. Oh, it's a Labradoodle. Oh, it's a Labradoodle. Okay, so for your large breed dogs, uh, medium to large, the giant breed dogs, 12 years old is actually a very advanced age. We're talking um, 90s plus for yeah. a person. And at this age, we start to see some cognitive um, dysfunction in addition to uh, diminishing senses. So sense of smell, hearing, sight, just like an older person. We see the same in our dogs and cats. And as a result, when your eyesight starts to go or your hearing starts to go, little sounds, 
new noises, new people in the house um, can be stressful and at times frightening. Um, so you try and regulate the environment as best you can, that's step one. But the other thing, and this is where your vet comes in, we wanna make sure that there isn't any um, significant diminishing of cognitive function, which we also see. So um, old dog cognitive disorder is something we see commonly in dogs nine, 10 and older. And for this, you see exactly what you described. And uh, additionally, you may see them do things like walk to the corner of the room and just sort of sit and stare. And you may say, hey, hey buddy, what are you doing? and they turn like uh, they don't know what's going on. It's almost like senility mm. in a dog. So I would have your veterinarian um, do a basic neurologic test and run through some of that first. But then um, again, controlling your environment is step one. And then two, it, it may require some pharmaceutical or product uh, intervention to help with the edginess, as you said. Okay, very helpful. We have a um, great question from Lynette. Are there specific issues with the diets of homeless owners' pets, and do you have recommendations on what one should donate to food banks or others for those homeless pets? Yeah, we, here's the thing that I thought's interesting, and I didn't know. I was, again, when I started doing this homeless work, I was a little naive myself. Um, these homeless people are, are connected to their pets on a very different level. Again, I've been doing this a while, and I've I've not quite seen the relationship or bond that I see with the homeless mm. and the pets that I see, um, you know, my normal practice with normal pet owners. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, they'll sacrifice their own meals, their own food. So a lot of times, yes, these pets will get, you know, mom's mm. leftover hamburger or whatever, whatever is around, and they can suffer nutritionally. Uh, as a veterinarian, there are I know, and it's in vogue now to try homemade diets and frozen diets and completely organic diets, but I'm, I'm more traditional. A, a regular dry food diet is the best way to go. It's nutritionally balanced and it has all the things a dog needs. So, and on that, there are various kinds you can give, but if you want to donate food, just regular high quality dry dog food um, to a local food bank is great. Or if you see a homeless pet on the streets, that, that's something they can carry around and will last for weeks and weeks to feed their pet. Yeah, and um, ju just so we um, capture it, if anybody that's on this call wants to actually donate to your nonprofit, Project Steep Street Vet, what's the best way for them to do so now? Uh, still to go to the GoFundMe, so there is a GoFundMe set up um, mm -hmm. called the Street Vet, and that link can take you directly to the donation site. Right. Because the vision is you really want to take this and scale it up so that there can be Project Street Vet work and play all across the country, right? That's the dream, and that's where I'm headed, hopefully. I, you know, I'm, I'm a one-man band for the most part right now. I started doing this myself, and for the most part still do. Primarily in California, that's where I'm licensed as a vet. But yeah, I would love it if I could spread, spread the word to more of my colleagues and, and have this happen around the country. I'm gonna correct you, Dr. Kwan. Um, and you have a much more prestigious degree than I do, but um, you are not a one-man band anymore. Charlotte's Web is so excited to <laughs> make it at least two. So we're here. We're here to support your mission. Thank you. Um, can you speak to CBD, um, not just Charlotte's Web products, but just CBD as something to enhance pets' wellness? Like, what's your professional kind of opinion based on yeah. the research? Look, so so. As veterinarians, again, we are sort of just on the forefront of understanding exactly what all it can do. And as veterinarians, we're basically scientists. We like data, we like research, we're nerds. So the more information we have, the better we can educate our clients. And we're starting to see some promising research in that respect as it relates to um, hip and joint health, for example. Um, anxiety mm -hmm. is another big one and stress. And, and discovering other potential applications um, like seizures in people. So I believe um, personally that there are a wide range of conditions that CBD can treat. And I think at one point here, and probably at one point in the very near future, it's gonna replace a lot of the traditional drugs that we've been using for a long time. What I like about CBD is so far it's shown to have a very wide safety margin. And so, you know, as, as a veterinarian prescribing medications daily, when pets get too much or they get into the medication and we see an adverse reaction, sometimes a fatal reaction, that's concerning. But with CBD in particular, 
that doesn't seem to be the case. Some of the early tests have shown um, very, very high levels of CBD in pets do not show um, serious reactions, yeah. which again is, is very promising to me. And again, the, the applications of it all. So I think, um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer, and, and look, 10 years ago, you asked me the same question, I probably wouldn't have given the same answer. And I think that's, that could be said for a lot of veterinarians. But if you ask most, most veterinarians today, they will tell you that it looks very promising. Great, that's, that's music to our ears. Um, we have a, a very specific breed question from Dana. My chihuahua gets aggressive on leash when encountering other dogs. Any tips? Yeah, so, so um, before I, I uh, disclaimer about Dr. Kwan, I get a lot of behavioral questions naturally and training questions, but I'm not a behaviorist. It's sort of learned on the fly as a vet, yeah. having my own pets and then trying to field the questions and then working with trainers and behaviorists. Um, so yes, most likely, and I do hear this from time, some dogs on a leash feel very protective suddenly of their space and their owner. Um, their leash almost feels like a tether to their home. So you leash them and they get around other dogs, they become aggressive. I bet you, I'm, I'm guessing that if you took the leash off and you were in an enclosed dog park area, you don't see the same reaction. So you're gonna have to um, condition your dog over time on the leash that it's not acceptable. There, there's a multitude of tips, tips online you can look up or probably work specifically with a trainer. This is where I'm going to get out of my league, so I'll stop talking, but I can, I can identify what most likely is a problem, but finding the solution for your specific dog will probably take a little work. Okay, thank you. And then, um, good question coming from Rick. With more of us working from home, it has changed a pet's routine. Have you seen any detriments to pets and the loss of their routine? And I guess this speaks to overall shelter in place and then you know once some of us are going back to work you know in some ways pets have had more time than ever due to the pandemic you know yeah so. i saw a funny um uh cartoon illustration it, it was uh, a cat sort of laying with its big belly on the couch and it said um hey jessica we need to have a talk when are you going to get out of my house <laughs> with, you know, everyone home, you know, around our pets more. And I think for the most part, it's beneficial. They like, they like us being around. We really are their universe. But it's a change. It's also a shift and a change for a lot of them to have us around more in their space. Maybe there's more noise or commotion or people visiting. Uh, the kids are home. Um, so, yeah, I can see that in some instances it's stressful. But I would say on the whole, they probably enjoy it and, and it doesn't take them very long to adapt. So I'm sure for a lot of our pets, they've adapted to having us around. Um, the bigger issue is gonna be when life gets back to normal, ultimately. And I don't know when that, when that is, but none of us do, but when we start returning to work after they've gotten used to having us around so much, I expect then that we're gonna see a flood of separation anxiety problems and, and those pets will need some help. So what do you recommend for separation anxiety? Um, you said stop the routine, stop the rituals, don't ritualize your departure. Um, do, you know, are there, are there other kind of behavior modifications that can happen? Um, are there particular pharmaceuticals that you end up having to use? There are. There's about three to four we can turn to. It's, it's, again, it's very specific to the case, typically. Um, but, yeah, we have... Um, medications in our arsenal or tool bag that we can use. But again, CBD is showing promise there too. I've heard a number of testimonials um, from clients and friends who have tried CBD in these instances and seen a lot of improvements, a lot of improvement rather quickly at that. Okay. Um, we have a question from Aaron. I have trouble getting my dog, eight-year-old husky, to eat. When I get him his dry food, he likes it for the first few days and then slowly stops eating it. I feed him twice a day, morning and dinner time, and he will just lay by it all day and then sometimes will eat it and sometimes won't. I've tried changing his food. I do the mixing between foods and it seems to happen every time. Is it normal for dogs which are becoming seniors to maybe just eat less? Yes, it is. Uh, just like people, as, as we get older and we age, um, our metabolic needs go down and no different than a cat or a dog. So depending on the activity level, depending on the age, the nutrient requirement or, or calorie requirement can go down significantly. 
the, the first question I would ask if the pet was in front of me um, is, have you seen noticeable weight loss? And if there has been noticeable weight loss, then we might have a potential issue. But if the weight's been steady, I don't worry about it. You know, we all have grandparents and we've seen them sort of pick and maybe eat a small meal one day and not eat, eat much the next day and they're fine. And that can be said for a lot of our um, geriatric pets. Can you tell me when my metabolic rate will be dropped so that <laughs> I finally eat less? Anyway, so we have a question. Um, I have a seven-year-old Maltese. He's an allergy dog and chews his feet to where they are bloody at times. He's also sensitive to any loud noise. Would the, would CBD be safe for my little one? Oh, poor guy. Yeah, potentially. Now, again, in cases like this, I, um, um, I do try to let everybody know that I, as a veterinarian, in order to specifically recommend the medication uh, for your dog, I have to be able to examine them. And that just um, keeps my license intact. So uh, I can't give specific recommendations on exactly what your dog uh, will need for a condition like this, but yes, potentially um, CBD could help. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, for allergies, and allergies, I live in California, so it, it feels like 50% of, of my patients have some sort of allergy. They're very common but we have remarkable um, medications for allergies these days. One is called Apoquil and the other is called Cytopoint. And these have sort of revolutionized um, allergy and the, the treatment of allergies in the last five or six years. So uh, if your dog is still doing a lot of foot chewing, which is a classic symptom of allergies, then speak to your vet uh, about trying something different or new if, if you haven't, and maybe you have at this point, but um, CBD may help in respect to the calming portion of it. Uh, I guess I should add this, for dogs that, that foot chew, it's not always an allergy. In some cases, rare cases, smaller population of cases, it's from anxiety. They will lick out of anxiety and boredom. And so in that case, yes, something different may help, but uh, typically 90% of the time or greater, it's an allergy. Okay. Um, can you just speak to, um, I guess what what you would think, all of us that are pet lovers, right? What's the one thing that you see commonly in your practice that's a bad human habit as pet owners that we do that you'd like to encourage us to work on? Oh, that's that's easy. One comes um, immediately to mind, and that is feeding from your plate because we all love to do that, and I'm guilty of that too, by the way, right? We we almost get uh, some kind of pleasure out of tearing off a little piece of meat from our plate and then dropping it to our pets. We know they love it, they get excited, but it just creates a very bad habit. And, and then, then you get upset when you have guests over for dinner one night and your dog is trolling the table and you keep telling them to go away. Well, you've trained them to do that. And, and additionally, um, I can see dogs that have serious reactions or toxicities depending on what you're giving them because not all people know um, what is toxic to a dog? There's a long list of things, actually, that are probably right in my own fridge right now in a lot of hours that mm. are not good for our pets. So, yes, please stop feeding from the table. Use treats. Treats are great. Keep treats on hand. But, you know, giving them little slivers of this or that um, in the long run is not a good idea. So we're, we're taping this, and I'm going to take this section and take it home to my husband, who feeds our Rhodesian Ridgeback bucket every single night. So... And then we wonder why our dog's overweight. Right. So, um, yes. If you need some additional backup, you can have him call me, okay? Okay. <laughs> will, you, will you shame him, please? Uh, that's my job. So um, we have another barking question. It's just a little different. I have a dog that's three and has issues with the door opening. She, bar she barks very badly. Anything that can help, it's even when we enter the room. So anytime they open the door, the dog begins to bark. Um, was that the gist of it? I, yeah, uh, uh -huh. it's just, it's, it's anytime the door opens, even if it's, you know, her pet parents, there's a lot of barking going on. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. And, um, I, uh, I can relate because we had a Yorkie for a while, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a big dog guy, but, um, the Yorkie was brought in the relationship and this little guy, anytime anything happened, he would start barking. And I tried just about everything, looked it up and, um, you know, tried to uh, 
condition him in a different direction. It, it, did, it just didn't work. Anytime he heard a sound or the door or the garage, he started barking. Um, I had to finally lean on a trainer friend of mine to step in and help. And I'm not sure exactly what he did, but it helped for a while. And then Charlie started doing it all over again. Oh, um, so we have one question, but I think we all know your answer. Um, just a fun one for 4th of July. What barbecue favorites should we avoid giving to their dog? <laughs> uh, I think that's all of them. Um, I think the answer is everything. No brats, no burgers, no tofu burgers. Like the thing is, if, if your dog has had a little hamburger meat before, that's okay. But what happens on these events is you have all these people around. And again, other people, guests, friends like to do the same thing. They see your dog, oh, and they drop some food. And then the next guest drops some food. And then, you know, an hour later, someone else does the same thing. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen dogs come in on emergency with a condition called pancreatitis because over the course of three hours or four hours during the barbecue, they've taken in essentially two pounds of, you know, red meat and their gut inflames, their pancreas inflames, and that's an emergency situation. So really the message to pet parents and people who come to your house, if your dog has any sensitivity to table food is please don't feed the pets. Yeah. Um, well, I I, and we're getting some inquiries. So could you just kind of explain uh, why Charlotte's Web was a good fit for you? You know, how, how is Charlotte's Web kind of a good puzzle piece with the work that you're doing as a veterinarian and also your, your mission-driven work? Yeah, well, look, I, um, as a vet who was, you know, two to three years ago, really started to dive in and personally investigate what CBD was about, the companies are out there, um, the reputation, their quality, you know, this answer is simple. You guys stand at the top. CW stands at the top, um, easily on the human side, and, and now you're breaking into the pet side. And the quality and the way you run your company and the way you treat your people, it flows from the human side to the pet side. And that was very obvious as I got to know you guys. So, and, and on that note, I will caution people because I got a, a question on my Instagram yesterday. Uh, about her dog that was experiencing the higher stone feeling every time she gave it CBD. My answer to her was first check the source. First check the source of the product because so often, look, there are many bad actors in the space as we know right now, mm -hmm. um, imitation players. And so you want to check the, store, the source and reputation of the people you're working with. And you guys um, stood out for, for many obvious reasons. Thank you. We're so honored. We're so honored to be part of this work um, that you're doing. And um, personally, I can't wait to see the day when Project Street Vet has a local chapter of volunteers in every single city in the country. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one more question because I think a lot of people are curious. Different than the barbecue question, is it okay to give dogs carrots, raw veggies like broccoli? My dog loves these. Yeah, veggies are a much safer treat, actually. So if you want to reach for something, there's, there's um, I guess if you want to consider that table food, vegetables are um, a pretty safe route. Uh, so yes, carrots are fine. Uh, broccoli is pretty good. Um, I'm trying to think of a few others. It, again, especially if they've been conditioned to have those. those. Those typically aren't a big issue. It's when you start giving them all the time um, or pets start asking or begging for those instead of their, their normal diet or their staple diet, because you'll start to see nutritional deficiencies over time because they'll sit and beg for the same thing over and over. Okay, so um, I think we're gonna wrap up. We wanna thank everybody for being so interactive today. We'd love to have your feedback. Um, you'll be receiving an email from Charlotte's Web and um, more information about our Searching for Answers educational series. Um, this is the first Experts Live I've moderated. Um, I had a blast. Uh, Dr. Kwan, I'm gonna have you close by telling us how you're going to be celebrating the 4th of July holiday. Wow, you're gonna put me on the spot. I, I don't know because I'm not sure. I, don't, I live in San Diego. I'm not sure what uh, we'll have going on here. It, it's, you know, as we all know, this COVID-19 situation is so fluid. And it seems like one week, country's open for business, and then we'll see a spike in cases. So um, I have children. I'll probably play a little more safe and maybe barbecue in my own backyard. And, and um, yeah, maybe a friend or two, but it'll be pretty low-key. 
and sans the fireworks. So, okay. Well, here's to kicking off our partnership. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you guys.